Christianity is a universal invitation to relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So God's children are all those who've answered his call to live in the big spiritual house that he is building. In fact, the most common depiction of what it means to be a Christian from Genesis to Revelation is simply to answer the call. Do you remember God's first act when man fell into sin? The Bible says God called to man, to Adam, and said, Where are you? Remember when he was preparing to deliver his people, the Jews, from Egyptian bondage, he called to Moses out of a bush, commissioning Moses to serve him. Now go all the way over to your New Testament and picture Jesus as he's walking by the seashore and he sees Peter and Andrew and he calls out to them and says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I want to say it again. Christianity is a universal invitation to relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And God's children are all those who've answered his call. Jesus summarized Christianity in what I like to call Christianity 101 in Matthew chapter 11. You know the text, don't you? Where he simply said, come unto me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest to your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm so excited this morning that Christianity is the universal call of Jesus Christ to planet Earth to come into relationship with God Almighty. Think about the Apostle Paul. His miraculous conversion took place because Jesus Christ called to him, spoke to him, and said, Saul, Saul, why are you making a mess of my church? Jesus spoke to him, called his name, because that is, in essence, what it means to be a Christian. It means to answer God's call. I love how Romans chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 summarize what it means to be a Christian. Romans 1, 6, and 7 says, you have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? I've been called by Jesus Christ to belong to him. I am his because he purchased me by his blood. I am his servant now. But in verse number 7 it says, you have been called to be saints. So God is calling us as his children to follow him, to know him. You know, don't you, that the church, the word church, simply means the called out ones. The Greek word is ekklesia. The church is made up, that spiritual house that we've been studying in the book of uh, 1 Peter, chapter 2, God is building a spiritual house. You are the living stones that he is using. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. So I couldn't be more excited this morning about the reality that God has called my name. I've heard his invitation of salvation. I've received him and have been redeemed by his blood and I'm now in right relationship with God and, and... Peter says, did you know you've been called to suffering just as much as you've been called to belong to Jesus Christ? You've been called to healing just as much as you've been called to be saints. And you've been called to relationship just as much as you have answered the call to honor Jesus Christ in all your life. That's the text that we're going to study this morning. Will you take your Bibles, please? And let's look at the text that I want to study with you this morning in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 21 to 25. And I'm simply titling this message, what are, we, what are we calling it? You are being called. I want you to watch what Peter says in chapter 2, verse 21, what God has called us to experience. In verse number 21, Remember, as always, the reading of God's word is more important than anything I have to say about it or any opinion that you hold about it. This is God's word. Verse 21, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him 
who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So Peter adds his voice to the rest of the biblical writers to detail the call that is upon our lives. And Peter says you've been called to suffering, you've been called to healing, and you've been called to relationship. Notice that he says to us, first of all, we are called to suffering, and Jesus Christ is the example that we should follow in our suffering. Now keep in mind, as I've told you numerous times, that many of the books of the New Testament were written as letters, as the apostles would address particular problems that were being faced in the early church. And so they wrote as letters. And when you're, writing, when you're reading those letters, you need to put it back in context. When you take any verse and consider its meaning, you need to remember the greater context. And the context here is that the people were suffering persecution. You recall that these early believers were suffering the angry punishment of Rome and even of Judaism that was persecuting believers. And so Peter says, I want to give you the ultimate strength for enduring the persecution that you're going to face as a result of being a follower of Jesus Christ. And he says, Jesus is our example. Think about it for a moment, what he's saying. The text seems to be telling us that we have been called to suffer. I know lots of people who are signing up to have their sins forgiven. I know lots of people who are signing up for the comforts and pleasures of being a Christian. But even I am caused to wonder how the Bible is so explicit about what it will cost you when you become a follower of Jesus Christ. And Peter's trying to urge these Christians to be faithful by following the example of Jesus Christ. So what was the suffering he's talking about? Well, he's saying that Christ is our example, and the suffering that Jesus endured, follow me now, it was suffering because he obeyed the will of God. Sometimes obeying the will of God is going to cost you great suffering in your life. That's why Paul said to Timothy, get ready and tell the church to get ready. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's part of being a follower of Christ. But I'm astounded when I think that Jesus suffered in response to doing the Father's will. To doing what God had planned for him. I hope you're tracking with me this morning. Because many of us have fallen into the trap of assuming that if I do the will of God, it will always be in my favor. I will get the job. I will get the promotion. I'll get the check. You don't necessarily get the job, the promotion, or the check. You may be demoted. You may lose your job for doing the right thing. <coughs> so being faithful to God, as Jesus Christ was faithful to God, may cost you more than you've ever imagined. So I think suffering could be defined simply as... Suffering the pain of obeying God's will. How do you know that you're walking in the will of God? Because your heart will end up broken at times. You will, like Jesus, be rejected by the people that you love. But it is the will of God to continue to follow Him and be obedient to Him at any cost. See, the joy of Jesus' heart was to do the will of God at all costs. The passion of Jesus' life was to honor the Father in all things. And he pressed forward even when it meant the loss of his very own life. So we are called to suffering. Paul told the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 that we are destined to suffer affliction as Christians. Do you remember this famous passage? It's used in all four of the Gospels. When Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. The suffering that we face is taking up the cross of Christ and dying to ourselves. 
I think suffering takes place when we are caught in the crossfire of the spiritual warfare that is going on in the world. We don't suffer because we have been disobedient to God, but because we've been obedient to God. We do suffer because we've been disobedient to God, but that's not really honorable, is it? Peter used that analogy himself. He said, what good is it when you do evil, you suffer for it. Take it, you deserve it when you've done wrong and you suffer punishment. But when you have done what is right for God's glory, for righteousness sake, and you take it as Jesus took it, it brings great glory to God. So get ready for the afflictions. I'm convinced more than ever that the role of a pastor in today's world in Canada is to get the church ready for the suffering that is coming as a result of being a committed follower of Jesus Christ. We are already openly mocked in the media of our country. We're already seen as, as ignoramuses. We are mocked openly because of our faith in Jesus Christ. I think it will move beyond that. As the church takes a stand upon the word of God, the comfort we feel this morning will undoubtedly cost us more than we ever dreamed in Canada. I shouted to my wife the other night when I was reading about some of the things that are happening in our country. I said, baby, we're already in the tribulation. I think we're in the tribulation. Not really. But I think it's my role to say to you, you've been called to suffer. Isn't it interesting that shortly after Saul was converted, the great apostle Paul became a follower of Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord that appeared to give him counsel said, I will show you many things that you must suffer for my name's sake. So Paul, get ready. Wherever you go to serve me, you're going to experience suffering and setbacks and hardships. Are you still tracking with me, church family? Have I lost you? I'm talking to people in this service this morning who know exactly what I'm talking about because you are presently suffering as a result of choosing to do what is righteous in the eyes of God. The Bible says of Jesus Christ, though he was a son, he's the son of God. He's the savior of the world. He's God Almighty who came in the flesh. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. The Apostle Paul even longed to enter into the sufferings of Christ. He wrote in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and that I might share in his sufferings. What does that mean? It means that my stubborn sinful heart has been broken of its need to do whatever it wants to honor Christ, to put Christ first in all things is to suffer rebellion even from your own flesh. So he says, now what he does in the text is he tells us that we're going to suffer and then he holds up Jesus Christ as a supreme example to encourage us to be faithful as he was faithful. And what does he call Jesus in the text? He actually calls him two things. He calls him our advocate and our example. Two little words in this passage that jumped off the page at me. The text says that he suffered for you. I think that's pretty cool. Jesus Christ is your personal advocate. You need to understand that he, he paid for your sins judicially, but he personally comes to your side to defend you, to support you, to encourage you. You see what Peter said in the text? Where is it? In verse number 21. For to this you've been called because Christ suffered for you. Those are two of the sweetest words in the Bible. Do me a favor, will you? Stick your index finger up in the air. Come on, help me out. Now point it at your chest and say, for me. That's what Jesus Christ did. He did it for you, the text says. I have a friend who's now in heaven. She was the first black woman to earn uh, a degree in social work and go back to her home island of Bermuda to establish the social work system in Bermuda. She was a follower of Jesus Christ, choir member in a local church, active. And one day in court, as she stood with a young woman whose name is Victoria, who had been in trouble with the law again and again and again, and the frustration that the judge was about to throw her in jail in juvenile detention. And my friend Ida stood up and said, Your Honor, I will take her home as my own daughter. 
I will advocate for her. I'll make sure that she's not back in your courtroom ever again. And when Ida died, I went to her funeral in Bermuda. And one of the most moving eulogies I ever heard was from this young woman who had now become a successful lawyer. And she gave testimony to the fact that Ida's love on that fateful day in the courtroom of Bermuda changed her life because someone saw her as an individual person, not just a criminal to be tossed in jail, but as a living, breathing human being, a young woman that needed guidance and love. And that's exactly what Jesus did at the cross. He didn't just pay for the penalty of my sin. He adopted me personally, by name to be part of his family. So he's not only our advocate, he suffered for us. He's our example. And here's Peter's point. He is sinless, yet he suffered according to the will of God. So his argument is that if Jesus, who did no wrong, but suffered because he was obedient to the Father's will, then we who are sinful but forgiven can endure the hardship of persecution and suffering as a result of being obedient to God. That's a pretty good argument, don't you think? St. John of the Cross used to say, when you're tempted to whine, when you're tempted to complain, think about Jesus Christ crucified and be silent. The only way we can be silent when we suffer is to look back upon our perfect example in Jesus Christ. And when we adore him and thank him for what he did, he gives us strength that we could not have otherwise. Notice that he emphasizes his holiness. He committed no sin. Jesus could not sin. He never did sin. It is not possible for him to have sinned. The Bible says he committed no sin. His honesty is emphasized in the text. He never spoke a word of deceit. Jesus Christ is good for everything he ever promised. You can bank on it till the day you die. You can sell your soul on it. That if Jesus said it, it will come to pass. He never spoke a word of deceit. He was harmless. I'm astounded at this. I'm sure if I'd been standing by Jesus when Pilate was commanding him to answer him, I would have said, Jesus, answer him, answer him. Speak up for yourself. But he didn't. As the sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth, the Bible says. He was being reviled. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But he did not revile back. He was being persecuted, but he only blessed those who were to crucify him. You see, to walk in the will of God means that he has to transform my heart that is easily offended and wants to, wants to protect itself and lash out at those who wound me with their words. I have not yet learned the heart of Jesus. And I must learn the heart of Jesus on this issue. Part of the text that really grabbed my eye is, I think it's a descriptor of the whole life of Jesus. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't revile when he was, he blessed those who were persecuting him, persecuting him. And, watch the text says, that he kept entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Do you know that was the final act of Jesus Christ when he died? And did you know further that Jesus Christ died on the cross meditating on the scriptures? The last thing that Jesus said just before he gave up the ghost, the Bible says, was, Into your hands I commend my spirit, which is a direct quote from uh, Psalm 31. So Jesus died meditating on the scriptures. He died to his dying breath. He was determined to obey God and trust his life to God. And he's teaching us to do the same. He wants you to trust God to the same degree that he modeled for us in his life. No matter how bad life gets, no matter how much you've lost, no matter how broken your heart is, cling to Jesus. Follow Jesus. Keep entrusting yourself to him. And he will always be faithful. We're called to suffer because Jesus Christ is the example that we should follow. Number two, we are called to healing in verse number 24, because Jesus Christ is the sacrifice for our sin. Did you notice that Peter describes sin as a disease? Be careful about theologians that unilaterally define the nature of sin. Sin cannot be defined with just one word. 
It is defined as a breaking of the law, but it's not all and only just a transgression of the law. There's more to it, God says. God says that it's like a leprosy or it's like a spiritual cancer that is ravaging your your soul. In this text, he's calling sin a wound, a disease from which we need to be healed. So he's telling us that sin is the deadliest disease that humankind can contract in their soul. And you've inherited it from your parents. It is pervasive and systemic. It is chronic and terminal. And you can no more heal yourself of the disease of sin than you can speak to a cancerous tumor in the center of your chest by the power of your will and command it to be gone. The cure can only come from God and the cure has come from God because of this dreaded disease called sin. You read it, didn't you, in verse number 24. Let me remind you about it again. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness because by his stripes we are healed. So what is he telling us? Simply that Jesus Christ drank the poison of my sin so that I can drink the cure of his cross. He bore my sins in his body on the tree. It means that Jesus Christ came to me with all the poison racing through my veins and said, give the cup to me. I will drink it on your behalf so that you can live forever. So that you can be forgiven. So that you can walk in obedience to God as I have modeled for you. I don't know a verse in all the New Testament that makes my heart sing like this one. Jesus took the garbage that is stored up in my soul and he removed it by the power of his blood. He washed it all away. I stand forgiven in his presence. He drank the poison of my sin so that I can drink the cure of his cross. He laid in my stinking grave so that I could live in God's very own righteousness. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Because he says, the reason Jesus bore your sin is so that you would no longer perpetuate its power in your life. You would walk in righteousness. That's the point of the text. Jesus booted me out of my grave. I was dead in my trespasses and sins. And he said, I will lay down there for you so that you can get up and walk in the righteousness of Christ. It's absolutely illogical and stupid for a Christian to persist in their sinful rebellion against God. It's a dumb choice. Do you understand that when you choose knowingly, we all sin, I know we do, and you sin knowingly every day, but when we do that, we're spitting in the eye of Jesus Christ. We're demeaning the cross. We're devaluing the gift of his blood and his body in the grave when we sin against God. As I was working through this passage, I had to bow my head several times and pray, oh God, sin is a real serious problem, isn't it? And I'm sad that I make such cheap excuses for myself. Magnify this cross in my eyes so that my sin will be so putrid, I'll I'll give it up. I won't go back there. Thirdly, Peter said, he suffered the scars of my sin so that I could receive the healing of his wounds. He says, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness because by his wounds we are healed. Let me say it again. He suffered the scars of my sin that I could receive the healing of his wounds. He's picturing sin as a machete that has slashed my chest wide open. He's picturing it as a knife that has been stabbed into my shoulder and I'm dripping of the blood. The the wounds of my sin have marred my body. It's messed up my mind. It's distorted my understanding of God. But Jesus Christ suffered the scars. of. Somehow they were passed, the scars of my sin were passed from me to him. At the cross. 
Do you understand what that means? By his wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. We've given you the readings for this week that churches often call the Holy Week, though every week is holy when you walk with Jesus. This is especially an important week for all of us when throughout this entire week we will go back in our minds to remember what he endured for us. Would you just think about it for a few moments? Because Peter highlights, by his wounds you are healed. The wounds began for him in the garden as he prayed. As he started to realize what was about to happen, his soul was in great agony to the point the pressure was so enormous upon his mind and heart that his capillaries started to expand and blood seeped out through his flesh. That was an agonizing moment for Jesus. If you ever go to Jerusalem, get to the garden as quickly as you can. Ask them to take you there first. Because it was there that Jesus said, Is there another way? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He was suffering, wasn't he? And then the Roman soldiers came to arrest him. And he was dragged. Perhaps this has, this has to be emotionally the most difficult part of the torture that he experienced when he stood before the high priest of Israel. His very own people, the Jews. Emotionally, he was now fully rejected. And they were nipping at his heels like rabid wolves. They finally had Jesus where they wanted him. They would humiliate him. They will destroy him. They will crush him. They will kill him. And he stood before his very own people as the high priest mocked him for his claim to be the king of the Jews. He was then subsequently handed over to the Romans. His own people now had rejected him. The emotional suffering had to be devastating. He'd been feeling it all along, but now it came to an epitome, to the apex of his emotional suffering, and now he's handed over to the Romans, and they stripped the robe off his back. In fact, he stood naked before them. Imagine the humiliation that Jesus Christ experienced in that moment. They took a whip, tied him to a post, and beat him to a pulp. Till most historians say, many men die at that point. Because at the end of every one of those whips would have been glass and stone and bones. He endured, that's the wounds by which I am healed. They then made a crown of thorns with three and four inch thorns and they embedded it on his head. So that you would not recognize his face because of the blood that dripped down his brow. And that's just the start of his suffering. They dragged him out to a place called Golgotha where they nailed him to a tree and hung his body for all to see. And they came by jeering at him and mocking him. If you are the son of God, come down from there. The worst of all wounds that Jesus Christ endured, barring none, was the weight of our sin, the poison garbage of our sin pressing down upon his soul in the moment that he cried out to his father, my God, my God, I've been a Christian 38 years or more. I still don't understand those words in their full import. I can't understand them. A member of the Trinity. Now, sensing complete separation from his father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To make sure he was dead, they jabbed a spear into his chest. It pierced his heart. And out came the blood and water. They confirmed that he was dead. Those are the wounds that he endured for me and for you. So that the filthy sin that contaminates my life could be completely forgiven. And I can be healed. That's what the text says. By his wounds you have been healed. The word healed here means to cause something to change to an earlier, correct, or appropriate state 
to renew. I told Max as I was studying this text, I could picture Jesus coming to each one of us and arguing with us. Why do you perpetuate the pain of your sin? Why do you hold on to the scars in your heart because of your sin? Because of your sin or somebody else's sin against your life? Why do you hold it so closely? When God wants to heal you of it, Jesus comes to each of us and says, let me absorb the scars, the pain, the, the humiliation, the fear and the doubt that come as a result of the things that have happened as a result of sin in your life. Whether by your own hand or the hand of someone else, Jesus says, give it to me, I will absorb it all. There's more power in the cross of Christ to heal the wounded hearts and minds of mankind than any other source. There is no pill or physician or psychologist or psychiatrist that can heal the wounded, broken hearts of humanity like his work at the cross. And you need to be confronted with his cross today. Because some of you, I can tell by the way you live, you're perpetuating the woundedness of your sin from your past. You keep thinking about it. You keep talking about it. You keep living in it. You keep holding grudges. You won't forgive. And all of that is to shun the work, the graphic punishment that Jesus Christ endured at the cross. See, the whole point of the cross is so that I can live again and walk in complete obedience to God Almighty. Thank Him for His cross today. I don't have time to address it, but in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus... Uh, performed several miracles of physical healing, and he alluded back to this very same text. That's another sermon at a different time, whether or not there is physical healing in the cross of Jesus Christ. But this text is focused upon the emotional and spiritual healing that comes as a result of the cross. Let me show you thirdly and lastly. We are called to relationship because Jesus Christ is the shepherd of our soul. That's in verse number 25. He details for us what it looks like as a Christian... When you've been forgiven for your sin and you are now committing yourself to follow Jesus Christ, the text says, you were like sheep that were straying, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. It's interesting that he depicts two of the greatest problems in the human heart. One is to continually stray from the God we know and love. The other is to be stubborn to take his counsel and to do what he has told us to do. And they're both in the text. A shepherd is one who leads us. He's the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. He's the great shepherd who's, uh, who is coming again. And he's the chief shepherd who will re return one day. So he's the shepherd who, that we're supposed to follow every day of our lives. But the text says he's also the overseer. The word simply means to watch over and to protect. So the picture of being a Christian is I come to the cross and I meet Jesus there. And he said, I'm not just the Savior who died for you on the cross. I am the great shepherd. I want you to follow me. I want you to go where I lead you. And when you go where I lead you, I want you to know I'm watching over you to protect you. And I will deliver you safely home. One day, I'm leading you and I'm protecting you. Now I need you to follow me. And listen, I need you to do what I tell you to do. The Christian life is that simple. Just do what he tells you to do and follow him. And you will be experiencing the joy of Jesus Christ being the great shepherd of your sheep. Isn't it cool to know that when I need someone to give me counsel, I can go to him. When I need someone to rebuke me, to correct me, I can go to him and he will do it for me. When I need someone to protect me because I'm weary, I'm bone weary and I have no strength to go on and I'm wondering about the future, Jesus Christ comes along and says, I am your shepherd and overseer. David said in Psalm 119, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Wow. Seek your servant for I do not forget your commandments. King David went astray. It's not just for sinners to go astray. Saints go astray too. They're all over the city. I had an email from a wonderful 
godly woman last Sunday morning after the first service. She and her husband were at a local grocery store picking up a few things, as I remember the story. They ran across a young couple that they recognized from their earlier days in another church in another city. They started talking about spiritual things, realized the young couple have stopped going to church. And they wisely urged them, get back on the path, kindly encourage them, get back on the path, because we're all prone to stray, we're all prone to stubbornness. So the conclusion of this text is simply this, return to the forgiver of your sins. Return to the giver of eternal life. Return to the shepherd of your soul. Return to the protector and provider of all your needs. Entrust yourself to Jesus Christ as he did to the Father and stay close to him as long as you live. Let me say it again. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you're healed. Salvation begins the day that you come to Jesus Christ and say, I see now that your sacrifice at the cross is the payment for my sin, and I want to accept your free gift of forgiveness. I come to you in repentance and faith, and I open my heart to you. But it's also for us, we who are Christians, to say to him, I need to keep coming back to that cross to find the healing of the wounds of my sin so that I can live in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and walk in his steps following his example. Will you pray with me, please? Can we just have a quiet moment with nobody moving about? Just a minute to think about what you've heard preached today. And ask yourself, what is God saying to me? What am I hearing from the Spirit? The Holy Spirit is speaking to His church. What is He saying to me? Would you listen? Would you accept it? Maybe you've never trusted Christ. And today is the day of salvation for you. Maybe you've never answered the call. And today you're going to answer the call and say, yes, Jesus. I hear your voice, the great shepherd of the sheep. I hear your call, and I'm coming home today. I'm returning to you. I've been straying on my own, but I'm returning to you. Some of you, some of us, are still wandering in the paths of sinfulness. We know full well as a Christian we should stop doing what we're doing. You know exactly what I'm talking about. The Holy Spirit's been trying to speak to you for a long time. You're lying, you're cheating, you're living in sexual immorality. Whatever it is, you're breaking his commandment and you know it. And you need to come back to him and say, don't fixate on your sin. Come back to him and say, I am repentant. I am sad that I would belittle the work of your cross like I am. And I ask you to defeat that power in my heart by the wounds you suffered. And finally, and lastly, I want to ask you, there are some of you sitting in this room that I know have been wounded by the sin of others or by your own sin. You carry those scars. You need to bring them to him today and say, absorb that from my heart. Sponge it out of my soul so that I can be dead to sin and live to righteousness. Lord Jesus Christ, you and you alone as the great shepherd of the sheep, know what's going on in the hearts and minds of your people. You know every need in this room. And if the need is salvation, I ask you to bring that one to yourself today. And I pray if the need is for uh, repentance in the life of one that has become a Christian, but is living in secret sin, then I pray that they will come to repentance today. And I pray that people will see there is emotional and spiritual healing in the cross. May your spirit absorb the wounds that have been so noisy and distracting in our hearts so that we can walk in close fellowship with you. Bless your word to your people today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.